uh, my name is Daniel Lazuma, and uh, this session is Humanity on Rails. Um, I, uh, a friend of mine recently showed me a commercial. Uh, actually, this was maybe about two years ago. Uh, showed me this really interesting commercial. And, uh, I'd like to uh, just play it here. So let's make sure that we have the sound on. I read an article, well, I read the majority of an article online about how older people are becoming more and more antisocial. So I was really aggressive with my parents about joining Facebook. My parents are up to 19 friends now. I have 687 friends. This is living. What? That is not a real puppy. That's too small to be a real puppy. Toyota Venza. Keep on rolling. I like commercials. In order, to, in order to really connect with their audience, they really have to kind of have your fingers on the pulse of what we're thinking and how we're doing as a society, right? This one, it, it kind of reflects this deep unease that some of us have about social media and social networking. This is living, the character tells us. And yet these images of people mountain biking, having a great time, they tell a different story. What is living? To what extent can we get it from Facebook? What do we make of things like this? This is a shot from RailsBridge, uh, I believe it was in Boston last summer. Um, for those of you who don't know, RailsBridge is a, uh, uh, an organization that's dedicated to improving diversity in our community. Uh, they put on workshops, uh, other types of events, uh, and really try to attract uh, women, other types of minority groups uh, into our community. Um, diversity is a, uh, it's, it's been a big issue uh, in our community recently. Um, I think for very good reason. I mean, there, probably most of us would really like to see more uh, diversity in our community, more people of color, more women, more you know, other organ, uh, orientations, personality types. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's an important thing. And so we're asking tough questions about it. How do we attract more minority groups into our community? Why is there so much imbalance in the first place? Are we doing something wrong? What do we make of things like this? How many of you uh, work remotely? Anyone work remotely? You, don't, you work at home, you don't commute into an office? You know, a few of you. It's actually pretty common, right, among the Rails community. A lot of us are freelancers. Uh, some of us, you know, we, we work with uh, companies that have a very strong remote program. Well, Yahoo, of course, recently, rather infamously, canned theirs. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about this. You know, is it a good idea? What do we make of questions like this? Is there a principled way that we can think about things like this? Or do we just accept that we all have our opinions and just kind of leave it at that? What do we make of things like this? These are some of the questions that I had uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, I had just been, I, I'd been laid off from a series of startups. This was uh, back in 2002, 2003, uh, the aftermath of the whole dot-com era. Uh, and so I was fed up. Uh, I decided I needed a break. So I put my career on pause, and I went back to school. I actually entered a theological program uh, here at Regent College. Uh, it's a well-known Christian seminary. It's located about uh, six hours north of here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, very well-known seminary. Um, uh, while I was there, I, I studied, uh, of course, the core curriculum of theology and biblical studies, uh, but I also did some research in technology, uh, in the philosophy, uh, theological approaches to technology and engineering. Um, read what scholars have been saying about technology and culture, uh, technology and society, uh, technology and spirituality, uh, different types of topics like that. Uh, I rubbed shoulders not only with pastors uh, and theologians, but also with other engineers, business leaders who were also studying here. It's a really great experience. And uh, when I came back, 
I, uh, I, I kind of rejoined uh, the industry. I uh, uh, started a company with a couple of friends of mine. We were doing Rails development. Uh, got into location, uh, location technologies. A few of you actually may know me as uh, the author of RGO, some of the GIS tools for Rails. Um, but my real passion has remained uh, the philosophy of technology. You know, what is technology? Is it just the making of machines and the writing of programs? Or is there something deeper, something more fundamental going on? Uh, what do we make of technology and culture? You know, how does technology affect our communities, uh, our relationships? How should we as Rails developers interact with technology, interact with engineering? Is there some way that we can do that in, in a way that's more healthy or most, more socially conscious? Interesting questions. A lot of people have been asking questions like this uh, for many years. Uh, there's actually a long history of thought in the philosophy of technology. And what I'd like to do during this hour is just to give you a little bit of a taste of what people have said, uh, what people have thought about and written uh, over the past few hundred years. Uh, so, of course, for a long time, uh, hundreds of years, uh, at least in the Western world, Technology was very closely tied to the arts. Uh, it was tied to the idea of craftsmanship uh, and actually related closely with religious ideas about humankind and its role in society and its role in creation. And over time, this changed. Uh, Europe uh, began to secularize. Uh, the Industrial Revolution broke out in the 19th century. And the technology and the arts began to kind of part ways. Uh, the arts were more focused on the aesthetic, uh, beauty. Uh, technology began to be more focused on issues of control, power. Uh, how do we gain influence? And this is a trend that climaxed in the 20th century uh, with people like French philosopher Jacques Ellul. Uh, Ellul, he was probably one of the, uh, the key people who really uh, thought about technology, thought about society, politics, and how all these things relate. This book, The Technolo Technological Society, uh, is his classic work on the subject. It was published in 1964. Uh, it's, uh, you can still find it on bookshelves today. Um, it's, uh, it's actually quite well known. Um, to Alul, technology is all about efficiency. Uh, it's about the rule or the hegemony, maybe, of efficiency. He saw a world that was filled with things, machines, business practices, political systems that were all in competition with each other about which, can be, which is most efficient, uh, where the, efficient, the, the more efficient systems uh, would continually replace the less efficient systems. It's almost like uh, there was a Darwinian process, a process of evolution taking place, a uh, process of natural selection where technology would continually uh, gain, uh, you know, become more and more powerful by virtue of being more and more efficient. And so, uh, so a little, you know, he, he talked about this and, and I think his main point was that uh, technology, it becomes a, a process of, uh, it's, it's almost like a force of nature. Uh, he, uh, uh, he talked about uh, how technology kind of runs itself. It's almost like humans are not, no longer in control of it. Uh, we're at its mercy uh, to some extent. Now, if you've done any significant study in philosophy, you've probably run into this fellow, Martin Heidegger. Uh, he was uh, probably one of the key people uh, in philosophy this century. Uh, he wrote a number of things on the nature of being, metaphysics. Uh, and his view of technology fits very well into that framework. To him, technology is a, a way of perceiving the world, kind of a, a, way, of, a way of seeing what reality is. Uh, now, if you've ever read Heidegger or tried to read Heidegger, uh, you've probably encountered the fact that he's quite abstract and maybe you could even say obtuse in, in his writing. Uh, so to really understand uh, what he's on about, let's take a look at an example. Now, I'm from Seattle. 
uh, and I'm sure many of us are from Seattle, from Portland, uh, different areas around here. Uh, it's a great place. We're, uh, we're all very outdoorsy here, or many of us are outdoorsy. We love, uh, our, we love our surroundings. We love hiking, we love skiing, bicycling. You've probably seen a lot of bicycles out there. Um, when we're around here and we see our outdoors, we see our environment, what is it that we see? What is it that we perceive? Do we see wild, untamed, natural beauty? Do we see a place to uh, enjoy or be challenged by nature? Is that what we see? Or do we see potential resources? This shift in perception is kind of the core of what Heidegger saw in technology. He saw technology as uh, a shift in the way that we view reality. Uh, it's, a, it's a way in which uh, we see reality not in terms of its richness or its own complexity, uh, its own being, but in terms of how it can be used, how it can be exploited. To Heidegger, technology reduces reality from what it is to how we could conceivably use it. In his words, technology challenges reality to fulfill a particular role. Okay, so that's great. So what does that have to do with software? Well, let's hone this in just a little bit more. Uh, Albert Borgman is a professor of philosophy at the University of Montana. Uh, he's written extensively on technology, and he's kind of taken Heidegger's ideas and run with them. Uh, and I think he's probably one of the more insightful voices uh, in the conversation right now. Um, this is his uh, seminal book on the subject, Technology and the Character of Contemporary Life. It was written in 1984, I believe. In this book, he introduces uh, a very important concept, uh, and that is the concept of the device paradigm. And once again, to Borgman, a device is not necessarily a machine, but it's a way of seeing reality. It's a way of, of perceiving what's going on. It's not a technical phenomenon, but actually more of a cultural phenomenon, or a psychological, maybe, phenomenon. So once again, let's take a look at an example. So take a CD player. Uh, a CD player. You, you all know what a CD player is, right? It's, I think we remember what it, I, 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 uh, I was giving this uh, talk to my wife the other day and uh, she said, are you sure that uh, people actually use CD players anymore? You know, do people actually know what these things are? So if you don't know what a CD player is, uh, you have this machine, you have this little plastic disc, unfortunately I don't have one to show you because apparently they're pretty rare nowadays, but you have this little plastic disc and you put, you, you put it in the machine, you press play and out comes music. Okay, pretty straightforward. The music is very available, very convenient. It's very easy to get. And Borgman has a term for this, what is provided by uh, the, the device. He calls it the commodity. And the commodity uh, in the device, uh, it's, it has this property. It's, it's easy, it's convenient, it's highly available. Now the other side, of a device is that which provides the commodity, which is what Borgman calls the mechanism, the internals of what's going on. And whereas the commodity is very convenient, very easy, the mechanism is, or tends to be, hidden, concealed. What do I mean by hidden? Well, how many of us actually have looked inside a CD player recently? How many of us actually know how the hardware works, how the electronics works? How many of us, even, even techies like us, actually can describe in detail the digital format of a CD? Probably not too many, maybe a few of us, but probably not too many. And that's Borgman's point, that you have, you have the, the, the commodity which is highly which is highly available, highly convenient, but is provided by you know, the, the, the real thing, the thing that provides it, what's active, uh, tends to be hidden, tends to be concealed. 
And so this is a device paradigm, act, uh, available commodity concealed mechanism. And this pattern actually should look very familiar to us as Rails developers, as software developers. Right. I'll give you a hint. Right. We have our own words for these things, right? We call these interfaces and implementations. And this process we call encapsulation. Right? This is what we do every single day to do our jobs. Right? Okay, so pretty straightforward. What's the point? Here's the point. To Borgman, the device paradigm, this process of encapsulation, is not an isolated incident. It's not limited to machines, to things that we think of as technical things. This process is a cultural phenomenon. It's something that uh, we, we basically use this process to interpret the world, to interpret everything around us, both technical things and non-technical things. It trains us, technology trains us to see the world as instances of this pattern. And we start applying it to everything, including people, including our friends, our coworkers, maybe even our customers. I mean, let's think about how we do a web business. I mean, what, what's, what's, what's the basis of a web business? Well, it's about, it's about views, right? It's about traffic. It's about counting eyeballs. How much, how, you know, how much traffic can we get? So here we are, we're building a web business, and we're counting eyeballs. Now what's providing the eyeballs? People, the customers. But it's because of this, this uh, focus on our metrics, our eyeballs, the customers, in, in all the complexity, in all the ways in which they want to interact with our service, tend to take a secondary place. They tend to be concealed in many cases. Now, once again, it's not a black and white thing, but it is a pattern. It is a pattern that we start seeing over and over again in our world as we interact with technology. Now, this thing isn't uh, changing here. So let's try this. Now, that's the climax of technology, according to Heidegger. Technology tends to apply this process to people. It turns around and, and, and applies it to us. So remember, technology, you have this process of reducing things down to their usefulness, hiding their complexity. Well, technology turns around and then says, OK, people, how are you useful? How can, how can technology utilize us? And it can. It can utilize us as users. We become technology's agents in applying this process of technology to other things. In Heidegger's, uh, to use Heidegger's language, we are challenged to then challenge nature. It's Heidegger kind of being a little bit meta. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's a little bit uh, confusing. So again, let's take a look at an example. So, a um, little bit of public confession here. Um, I hate Twitter. Uh, I, I seriously hate Twitter. I mean, <laughs> seriously. I mean, I, I, I freaking hate Twitter. I mean, it's just, and you know, I, I'm actually, I'm sure some of you are tweeting that right now. I mean, uh, but anyway, why do I hate Twitter? What, what is it about Twitter that I don't like? Well, I mean, I, I don't like it personally because I mean, it's, to me, it's just a step backwards in social communication, right? Um, Twitter, it, it privileges these, these small soundbite broadcasts, and it tends to exclude uh, the more nuanced communication, uh, the, more, uh, you know, the more deep reflection that I think is more valuable. And yes, this has been a debate for a number of years and, and so forth and so on. This is just where I tend to fall on it. Um, any, anyway. I hate Twitter, but despite that, I am forced to use Twitter. I have to use it. Why do I have to use it? Because the community is on it, right? Everyone's on Twitter. 
I mean, if, if I want to find out, like, if I want to find out when RailsConf is selling out, I have to be on Twitter. If I want to, if I want to promote my own open source projects, if I want to be available to support them, I have to be on Twitter. If I want to participate, if I want to be relevant, I have no choice. I have to press that tweet button. It's like I no longer have freedom in this matter. I have to be on Twitter. I have to be on it. Technology is now dictating to me what I can and cannot do. Borgman puts it this way. He says, technology is no longer a choice for us. It's no longer a choice. To a large extent, we no longer have the freedom to take technology or to leave it. Instead, technology has established itself as the basis for our choices. To a large extent, it's begun dictating our choices. We no longer critique technology. We no longer look at technology and say, oh, that's good or that's bad. Technology has actually begun to critique us and tell us, this is how you should live your life. This is the best way. This is the more efficient way. So interesting points of view. Some interesting points of view. Now, this is, some of these are kind of negative. Uh, not, all of the, not all of the discourse has been this negative about technology. Um, Andrew Feinberg is one of the more recent voices in the conversation. He focuses on the social and political aspects of technology. Uh, he, he talks about how technology shapes and is shaped by uh, human community. Samuel Florman is an uh, engineer himself, a civil engineer, I believe. Uh, he talks about uh, the experience of engineering and what it means to be uh, uh, you know, a thoughtful engineer and what, what it means for engineering to be a, a meaningful and fulfilling activity. So there are lots of different ideas, uh, lots of writings. Uh, what I'd like to do, I think, for the uh, last few minutes of this talk is to, to really dig into one uh, particular concept that I think is uh, particularly maybe relevant to us uh, as a community, as the Rails uh, community. Uh, and to an extent, uh, I think it's maybe a little bit uh, counterintuitive uh, as well. So we all believe that technology has value, right? We all believe that technology is valuable, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But there's, an, there's another question that I think is somewhat more interesting. That is the question, does technology have values? Does technology have character or personality in and of itself? The word some people like to use is meta-narrative. Is there a meta-narrative of technology? Now, for us uh, as engineers, Typically, we respond to questions like this by making a distinction. We make a distinction between technology and how it's used, right? When we say, when we talk about the use of technology, then we start saying, okay, uh, you, you, can, you can critique that for ethics. You can say this is a good use of technology. No, this is a bad use, a misuse of technology. But when we look at the technology itself, when we look at the, the, the source code itself, we say, no, that's, that's neutral. It doesn't make sense to critique that for ethics or anything else for that matter. Maybe for technical things like, uh, like maintainability or you know, that sort of thing. But when it comes to ethics or maybe personality, eh, it's not so clear to us that it makes sense. Another way to put it, if we look at the ends for technology. It makes sense for us to critique the ends, but not the means. When we're talking about ethics, the means is neutral. Only the ends matters. Or another way to put that, the ends justifies the means. Okay. 
Now when we think about that and we put it that way, now maybe we're feeling less comfortable about it. Because this is, this is an ethical statement. This is a statement of morality, right? This is a statement that we may or may not agree with. And that's precisely the argument of the device paradigm. Remember the device paradigm? How the, the commodity is available, it's highly visible, highly, uh, highly convenient. The mechanism, the means, is hidden. If technology looks like this, technology is saying about the means, don't worry about that. Don't worry about the means. It's hidden. It's out of sight, out of mind. Focus on the ends. Focus on the use. Focus on what you get out of it. If technology looks like this, then technology is what's encouraging us to believe that the ends justifies the means. Technology itself is making a moral statement. And so that's, that's, a, that's a common theme that you find in a, a lot of the discourse on technology. Technology is not value neutral in and of itself. It has values. It has personality. Now, I'm not saying that it has the wrong values or a bad personality, but it is real. It has personality. And it's important for us as developers to be aware of that. Why? Well, because if technology has personality, then that's going to affect the way in which we relate to technology. That's the, going to affect how we use technology. If, if we think about social networking, social networking as technology is mediating our communication with each other, our relating with each other. So if it has personality, that's going to affect how we communicate. It's going to be a third party in our relationships. Maybe that's the root of why we feel unease sometimes about social media, social networking. Let's push this a little bit farther. If technology is a cultural and social phenomenon, if it has values, if it has its own character and culture, then that might mean that it has its own intrinsic biases as well. Like any cultural phenomenon, technology may tend to privilege certain groups over others. Technology itself might have an affinity with some genders or ethnic groups or other subsets of the population over others. Ooh, that makes us feel very uncomfortable, right? So let me clarify some things. I am not saying that technology excludes anyone. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying technology excludes. I'm also not saying that we should just sit back and accept the status quo and say this, this is just the way that engineering works and that's just the way it is. I think we all agree that we want to improve the situation. We want to improve the status quo. We want to improve diversity in our community. What I am saying is that if technology has a particular personality, and if, we, if we're serious about improving diversity in our community, then we have to pay attention to that. We have to pay attention to the nature of what it is that we're working with. Now, normally when we talk about diversity, we focus mostly on uh, we focus on oppression, right? We focus on uh, eliminating harassment, right? We focus on eliminating, you know, not doing things that are, or not saying things that are alienating to people. And yes, this is highly important. This is step number one. But if technology itself, at least what we, what we think of as technology and how technology works itself out in our world, if that has a personality, if the and if that personality favors things like power and control over and against things like relationships or community, that might induce some kind of a bias. 
what kind of bias? I'm actually not sure. Maybe we have a vague idea, maybe an ethnic bias, maybe a gender bias. Um, maybe someone else here has a better idea than I do uh, about this. But the point is, the point that I want to make is that it is a real bias. And if it's a property of technology itself, if it's inherent to what we are doing as engineers, then our tendency is going to be to take it for granted. Our, our tendency is going to be not to see it, not to question it, not to challenge it, because we think this is just the way things are. And that is something that we cannot afford to have happen. If there is, if there is some biases inherent in what we are doing, and if we, if we are serious about things like diversity, then we cannot afford to have those biases hidden and unchallenged. We need to question them. We need to question technology. We need to develop awareness of what it is that we are working with so that we can address issues like this. This awareness is crucially important and especially uh, important for people like us, those of us who work in software engineering. Why? Why us? Well, because we are the technological elite. We are the ones who are uniquely qualified as software developers, as Rails developers. We are the ones uniquely qualified to understand technology, to understand how it works, to understand how it's affecting us, and we are also the ones that are uniquely positioned to drive technology, to shape it, to define how people and online systems, technological systems, and so forth, are going to be interacting for the next five years, 10 years, 20 years. It's up to us, the technological elite, because if we can't figure it out, who else can? Who else will? Now here's the good news. Here's the good news. We actually have some great resources. Rails is a great technology. And I'm not saying it's a great technology just because you can make web apps really easily. Again, don't get caught up thinking about usefulness only. Rails is a great technology because it teaches us about technology having personality. Rails is famously opinionated, right? Rails has values. It has technical values like, like convention over configuration, don't repeat yourself. DHH talked about document-oriented uh, applications. Rails has technical values. It also has social values, in particular, transparency. Rails is unusually transparent about its values, about its opinions. Rails invites us to dialogue with it, to engage with it about its values, about its opinions. It invites us to dialogue with each other, with our peers, about its values. And that, I would say, is one of the great joys of working with a technology like Rails. It invites us to engage. Another resource we have is open source. Now remember, device paradigm, how the interface is available, convenience, the mechanism, the mechanism is hidden. Well, open source actually turns this around. Open source says, we're going to make the implementation, the mechanism, visible explicitly. We're going to make this the, the main point. Open source actually fights against the device paradigm. It invites us to look into the technology itself, to engage with the technology itself, and in so doing, to enrich the technology and to enrich ourselves. I mean, how, does, how do you measure the success of an open source project? Right? The success of an open source project is not measured by how many people are using it or, or how easy the API is to use. 
the success of an open source project is measured by how engaged the community is with the source, with the implementation, with the mechanism. Sorry for my uh, iPhone 3 photo here, but if you remember the slide from this morning, DHH was, uh, was showing us not the number of users of Rails, but the number of contributors, how the number of contributors has been improving over time. This is the pattern that you want to see in a successful open source project, improved engagement with the source. Open source is successful to the extent that it operates against the device paradigm. And as such, I think it provides an interesting model for us to, for how to live and how to work with technology in a healthy and beneficial way. Finally, we have a community of uh, very good people, people who are skilled, people who are experienced, deep thinkers. Uh, that's one of the things that I've really, uh, really appreciated about the Ruby community. Um, not just the Ruby rogues, of course, but the Ruby community in general. I mean, we're a community of, of, of artisans, of tinkerers, of scholars and poets, people who are not satisfied with just getting a job done, but want to see it done well. We're a community of people who are here in, in a place like this, not because we, we use technology, not even because we build technology, but because we love technology. We love technology. And that's a powerful resource. And it's a very high calling. But it's a calling that we as a community really ought to embrace. Because this is our field. It's up to us. It's up to us to understand technology, not just in a technical sense, but also in a metaphysical sense, in an ethical sense, in a relational sense, so that we can learn to live well and work well with that technology, so that the world around us can do the same. We are the ones driving it. It's our responsibility. Now, of course, these are very big topics, very big, very important topics. There's only a limited amount of things that I can do in, in 35 minutes to, to talk about it. So something that uh, I've put together, if you want to learn more, uh, this page is not up yet. I will have it up uh, probably within an hour. Um, but I've put together a list of uh, getting started resources, uh, books, uh, blog posts, links, discussion groups, um, uh, just uh, a bunch of uh, reading material and things if you want to uh, kind of get started, get in on the conversation, see what people are saying, see what people are thinking. Uh, this, will be, uh, this will be available. Slides will also be available here as well as the, the video once we get that up. Um, so that's there. And of course, uh, since everyone gives out their Twitter handle, here's mine. And you all know how I feel about Twitter. Um, <laughs> don't use it. but. Uh, just because everyone does this, you know, there it is. So thank you for coming, and uh, let's continue the conversation. We have uh, a great conference ahead of us. So thank you very much.